All aboard! The gang of good fellows are we, are we, are we, are we, with never a worry you see, you see, you see, we laugh and joke, we sing and smoke and live life merrily. no matter the weather when we get together we have a jubilee, hail, hail, the gang's all here, what the deuce do we care, what the deuce do we care, hail, hail, we're full of cheer. What the do we care now? <laughs> Hello. Here we are. February 27th, 2023. And we see some great folks in the... <laughs> Let's say hi to some of you folks. Let's start right here. I've been doing good, Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tommy Bridges. How you doing? You never catch up on a hot dog. Yeah, you got it. RV Doc, how you doing? Good to see you folks. Bill Kirschmeyer. The crowd. <laughs> How you doing, guy? We have a nice comment here. That's uh, from Jack Napier. Napper? Hi, all. Jimmy was a good friend of my pop. He was always kind and a gentleman. Always told my pop, you ever have a problem, just let me know. I'll take care of it. Bet he did, Jimmy, or Jack. <laughs> he could take care of a lot of things. One of the first things that uh, I was looking for pictures of him, and I came up with this one, and I think it probably relates to him mostly. However... Uh, <laughs> telephone, and that's going to go off. <laughs> hmm. At any rate, the first time I ever heard anything about Mr. Iandino was way, way back in the, uh, can I get this up? There we go. Got to take care of it. Was way, way back in the early 70s or mid 70s. Um, John Osborne of the FBI brought him to my attention. They had a tape of Jimmy Iandino. And uh, he hadn't earned the name uh, the ice pick by then. But uh, he was collecting from somebody that the FBI wired. And the guy was wired and he was taking a beating like you can't imagine. I mean, this sounded terrible. The actual, you know, tape was ridiculous. And they watched him. They watched him beat the guy just so they could get enough to put him in jail, prison. I think his real claim for fame, other than the other things he got into in later in life, was the fact that he was a juice loan collector and also a lender probably. But I think he started out as a collector only and worked his way up and there was a lot of vacancies through the mob as you know um or maybe you don't know <laughs> but uh, i always thought of him as, as a very violent man um i would put him up there with um uh, um probably the 
crazy people, as far as I'm concerned. He, uh, he hurt a lot of people. He may have helped some people that he liked, but if you went into business and you were borrowing money on juice, you were probably stupid because you were definitely going to take a beating from him if you didn't pay. How you doing, Catherine? Vlad, I'll bet you do miss that, that Chicago casino. It is good. Jerry Cruz. <laughs> sure is. Michael Graham, how you doing, buddy? At any rate, that's my first even knowing anything about him. It was all over the news. Um, he worked out of Cicero. I never met him. But believe me, I heard a lot about him. I think everybody did. He was vicious. I'm sure he's responsible for a lot of murders, which probably doesn't make him very high on my list of... Uh, uh, people to know <laughs> or wanted to know. Ultra Cowboy, Semper Five, buddy. At any rate, uh, Suzak, is Phil Cozo still alive? No. Philly passed away some time ago. Thank you, Philip. Philip Dilberg. Hi, Red. Enjoy reading your book. Thank you so much, buddy. I really appreciate it. I don't know. So I, I was looking, and three new people went to Amazon, and they wrote um, uh, reviews on my book. And uh, I was kind of uh, happy to see the reviews. And I got a kick out of one. And if you go to Amazon, you write a review or something like that, you're going to see it. See it. But the one that I got a kick out of was the guy liked the book. The reader liked the book. But at the end of it, he said he was disappointed because he didn't know if I was ever married, if I ever had any children. Um, I don't know if everybody puts every, all that in their, their bio, you know, their personal life, um, their wives or ex-wives or children that they've had. But I was thinking about it and saying, this is very, very personal. I mean, um, I don't think all you people here that are tuning in, uh, talk about your families, uh, on YouTube or on something that's going to be on the air or in a book that's in print. But um, I kind of keep my family out of it. Uh, believe me, everybody's uh, passed on in my family. Uh, everybody. Uh, I lost my wife in 2002. Um, that was my second marriage. It uh, was a sad thing. And I don't, the rest of my family, I don't even like to talk about because there's too much pain. And I outlived them all as I did a lot. And let's get back to the story. And I, I really appreciate all the reviews. Anybody that writes a review for me, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I look at all the books that I've sold and I turn around and say, how come there aren't? Reviews. I mean, how come there aren't enough reviews? Anyway, let's get back to your questions. Michael, what town did Jimmy last live at? I live in last. I believe it was Darien, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I might be wrong. 
I didn't really keep up with him. But he was part of the Cicero crew. Geoff has a comment here. Jimmy started working for Fifi and the Turk. Turk Torello. Michael Graham. Written into minor a majority of the gamblers just borrow juice money and, and pay it back without problems. I would say the majority did. They were afraid. They there were examples made of certain people. Matter of fact, um, there's one particular one. I don't know who it was for sure, but um, uh, Jimmy evidently told the guy that was supposed to collect the money. He worked for him. He said, I'll call him. And he called him up and said, you don't owe me any money anymore. Goodbye. And that was like, he was dead a few days later. So you know, that was what it was all about. Christopher, it's not an audio book, but you can listen to it on YouTube. There's a playlist where you can actually listen to it. Philip Dilberg, I used to ride horses at that stable that Helen Brock was murdered in Tinley Park. You did, Philip. I wonder what year. If it was uh, Camelot then, or if it was Sky High, or what it was. Did Jimmy do any time? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Um, just like people that it's it's very uh, <laughs> very interesting how they uh, they have to they have to do time. It's a matter of time. That's very true. And also, um, you know, um, you remember Calabrese Sr. took over a house? I believe um, Mr. Iandino did that also. Jack Rapper. Red, yes, Jimmy was a very violent and ruthless, but my pop didn't know. Yeah, that side of Jimmy. Jack, it's the same thing with me and Tony Spalaccio. It's the same darn thing. I knew Tony, but I never knew Tony to be violent. I never saw him violent. We never talked about violence. We sit around and drink scotch. So thank you for your comment, Jack. I <laughs> I didn't know if you're a fan but of his, but uh, nice guy. Philip, Sky High Stables. Well, that had to be when I was around, Philip. Did you have a horse there? Do you remember me at all? Don't know. We'll see. Jack, I'm glad we agree on that. A lot of people don't understand how you can have a relationship or a friendship with somebody that is violent and it's really bad. I mean, the relationship's not bad. And here we go back to Sky High Stable. Oh, you rented horses, Philip. You were on the rent line. Livery horses. That was on the north side of the barn. Michael Graham, Red, I'm curious. What did Frank Schweiss tell the IRS he did anything for a living? I don't know. I really don't know. His attorney was uh, uh, Alan Ackerman, so I'm sure he took care of it for him. How you doing, John?
Poised for duty. The mob is a career. Business, nothing personal. You know, I really believe that. I really do. If you if you happen to, you know, get into them, then uh, you know what you're getting into. You know exactly what you're getting into. And in his particular case, I was reading one of his cases uh, last week. Anthony Martini from Street Stories um, sent me, uh, a couple of people sent me notices on Facebook and said, uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, Joey Iandino had passed away. And I started thinking about him and saying, wow. Oscars Royal, how you doing, buddy? Red, can we still get an autographed copy of your book? I bought it on Kindle, but I want a physical copy as well. Yes, you can, uh, Star Wars. I'll put it in the link here for you. It is in the, if you look at the program, it's um, in the description. There is a link for it. We can go directly to it and get an autographed copy. Um, I'm going to put in here for you. If you go to redwaymet.com, you you should be able to order a copy there, buddy. Charles How you Wolfman Mark, always love seeing you, Red. Thank you, Mark. Or should I call you Wolfman? <laughs> you remind me of, uh, your name reminds me of Wolfman Jack. That's back in the day for me. You're so welcome, buddy. And when you order it, it'll be made out to your, I'll make it out to your first name. I'll say two and put it in there. Uh, uh, Mr. Apollo, um, he was 80 years old. And that's pretty good. He, out, he outlived a lot of people. You know, I'm really not sure, Alpha Boss. Several people have asked this, so I'll answer your question. I'm really not sure, but I can tell you he never went to trial. So if he was indicted in Family Secrets, if he was, he pled out. It's like Kirk Calabrese. He was indicted, but he never went to trial. He just pled out. A lot of people pled out. Many people. Tim Hunt, is Adam going to spin the wheel this week? I don't know what Adam's going to do. I really don't. Anyway, um, his career, as he said, at one of his sentencings, when he was being sentenced by a judge, I think it was Ken Lowry, uh, might have been around 1978, 77, 78, and um, he told them to have mercy on him that he would, uh, he told the judge and he was going to try. He knew he was a career criminal and he was going to try and change his ways. Well, he never did. 
As a matter of fact, out in the town of Cicero, um, where I grew up, not grew up, where I lived as a teenager, um, I really grew up in the Marine Corps. <laughs> um, he uh, got involved with Betty Maltese, and I believe he was involved in that trial, too. And they were taking kickbacks from uh, Cicero, uh, the trucking industry. He was big in that. He was caught with a stolen truck. You, I, all kinds of, you name it, he was in it. And uh, I would say the majority of uh, the stuff he was in was not, or the crimes that he was committing, were not like he started out with the juice loan business. Although he had people put money out on the street for him, and he did a lot of things. Tim Hunt, watch some cops on Ohio Street. They make their own rules. Okay. <laughs> I think they all do, Tim. But at any rate, um, uh, being part of the Cicero crew, I'm sure he was well recognized by Joey Yupa. And um, I'm sure he was well recognized by uh, uh, Tony Accardo. It really, it really seems that way. Mm -hmm. Geoff, Jimmy wasn't in Dyden Family Secrets. I, I wasn't sure whether he was or what, wasn't. I really wasn't and sure. So I said I'm not sure. But like, there were a lot of people who did plead out, so it was hard to tell. A lot of defendants. Good afternoon, Tim. How you doing, buddy? Robert, Robert, 0969, hello, Red, sorry you're late, never be sorry you're late, I don't think you missed much, if you did, you can, uh, you can always replay it, and see what you like, hit that like button, thank you, Jim. Please hit that like button. I need all the help I can get. <laughs> there are so many channels out there that deal with the mob or Chicago outfit and other organized crime. And it's kind of crazy because my bedtime stories go back to 2016 on my channel. And it's, it's really different because I look at other people, they start in, in 2018, 19, 2020, during the pandemic. Big Mo. Hey, Red, top of the week to you. Adam and I were just talking about you, Mo. Thank you, buddy. Red is the real deal. <laughs> what is your MAS? Mass car phone? <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Leanne, rolling along. How you doing? You and Adam have the best channels. Thank you, dear. Thank you, Leanne. I hope you're doing well. If you're rolling along, I hope you're safe. Well, there was no show last week. I didn't have a Monday, and Adam didn't have um, uh, a Wednesday. His wife had surgery. A minor surgery. And he's helping her along right now as much as he can. But we have shows planned. We, we had them planned. They're up there. And uh, we'll just have to do them this week. I'll do, I'll do an after party as usual.
Tim Hunt. But yours is the best because you were there. Well, I was there. But I did not meet Jimmy Iandino. They call him the ice pick in later years because he did ice pick a lot of people. Jim Magnifici, you have a question. Was Tony Spalaccio coming to visit you around the same time frame as Frank Schweiss? No. Uh, Tony was murdered when Frank was coming around. Big Mo, I'm going to hit the Vegas again. <laughs> I got free. <laughs> Two brand new <laughs> 21 year olds I want to experience Sin City. My daughter wants me to take her to the Mom Museum. I may take her on the new crime tour. You'll like it, Mo. Really. Adam has the best tours I've ever seen. Really. Tim, Tim Stuffs. Hey, Red, I'm a little confused about Ayupa's role in the outfit. A lot of people said he was scary. And then at the Last Supper, he was ranked 10th out of everyone <laughs> in the boss doing casinos. Um, I never knew him. I heard stories about him. And as far as being scary, I think he was scary. The reason made him so scary, he was very nonchalant about okaying a murder. If he wanted somebody, if somebody came to him for an okay, it was like, yeah, go ahead, do it. I mean, he didn't really look into the matter, uh, see if they need, needed to sit down or something like that. He'd just take one person's side, one side of the story, and okay it. But that's the way I saw him. The outfit seems to like ice picks. More than New York did, more than any... Uh, New Orleans or any place else. Um, they really did, Scott. Mo, your daughter said, is your daughter, your 21 year old daughter, scare, um, shares the uh, same love for organized crime history? Well, you got to take her out to Vegas, Mo. <laughs> Scott H. has been on several times. Michael Graham, when all, did all the other Alpha guys know how close you were with Tony uh, and your close friendship with Tony make you untouchable at that time? Um, not all of them. I mean, I don't think we took on the newspaper and put everything down on paper. But I will tell you, Mike, that um, Joey Lombardo knew about it. Frank Schweiss knew about it. The people in the Grand Avenue crew knew about it. Because, you know, they'd say, did you see the little guy? And I'd say, yeah, I saw him. Or something like that. Jack. Napper. Red is the closest... <laughs> We have of knowing about the outfit because he was there. And we appreciate it. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate it, too, that you recognize it. How well, Tim, how well did I know Chucky Nicoletti? I didn't. Milwaukee Phil? I knew him. He was part of that original crew that I met. And um, as far as anybody, every, everybody has their own opinion. I never saw a bad side of the guy. He was, he was tough. He was stern. Um, but he wasn't mean. I didn't see him as mean. But I heard some things that he did was mean. Like that vice on the head that you saw in Casino. That was, uh, he was there. That was his big idea. Ice picks were a way to break the ice with people. 
<laughs> yeah, it broke the ice. <laughs> you mentioned Schweiss, uh, uh, mascara foam, mascara foam. Uh, you mentioned uh, red. You mentioned uh, Schweiss was Phil's bodyguard. And did he ever, did he, did any other bosses have their own personal bodyguards? I don't know. I really don't. Um, he, you know, Phil lived uh, right next, uh, Schweiss lived right next door to Milwaukee, Phil, in uh, North Riverside. And uh, they had the house next door. And uh, it was, it was different. Uh, when they came to arrest Phil on a weapons charge, one of the one of the agents I knew that was there, an, F, an ATF agent, Jimmy Deloro, uh, he talked about uh, how Schweiss came out of the house like a maniac and attacked several of the agents, and that that he was uh, arresting. They didn't. I get evidently he said he didn't know they were agents. Was Chucky Nicoletti before my time? No, he wasn't, Tim. I was involved in the outfit since uh, in 1968. And uh, in 19 August of 1971, I became an FBI mole to dig deeper in. Tim Steffels, amen to that. <laughs> Thank you, Red, for your every, everything you've done. You're a remarkable human being. Thank you, Tim. God bless you. I like the compliments. I'm a, I'm a ham, I guess. <laughs> Outfit boss. Was it Frank Schweiss, Joy Lombardo's bodyguard? No. No, as a matter of fact, we referred to uh, Frankie as Joy Lombardo's bulldog because he used to say, hey, you know, go take care of that, and he would take care of it. He did whatever Joey told him to. But he didn't live next door to him. He didn't drive him around. He really didn't take care of him. Frankie was just a hitman. That's all he was. He would kill people. Huskers Royal, read as a piece of American history. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hit that like button, please. And if you haven't before, subscribe. Tim has another question here. Who is higher up, Chuck or Phil? Milwaukee Phil. Definitely. Well, Jerry, all I can tell you is uh, it's a lot of work to do it, and Adam hasn't had the time, and uh, I need him to do we got to do it together because he actually has the tapes, and I've got to decipher them. So he wants to put subtitles on them so you people can read them. Thomas, did Frank Schweiss ever murder the transvestite that beat him up? No. <laughs> I don't think he ever murdered transvestites ever. Big Mo's got a question here, too. Oh, I just answered. <laughs> you just answered my question. I tried it, buddy. Did I ever meet Tony Accardo? I don't think I was on the high enough on the food chain to even get close to his house. He wouldn't have known who I was. Kissy Cat, how you doing? Big smiles.
Big Mo, who was on the Dorfman hit? Frankie Schweiss. It was a signature kill, in my opinion. Um, just a guess. I know Frank was on it, but just my uh, guess on my part, um, Albie Vienna was the second shooter. I've never named him before. On, <laughs> on February 27, 2023, I named him. Albie Vienna was allegedly the second man. There were two men there. I know for sure it was Frank. I mean, the guy had, the guy had uh, 22 caliber, uh, I think it was seven or eight shots in the, in the head, in the back of the head. And that's Frank. He liked, he liked to put one in the leg and seven in the head, so he told me. But if he had a chance to, he'd, uh, he'd do the uh, <laughs> all of them in the head if he was close enough. Johnny Fudge Knuckles, how you doing? Hit that like button. Red, do you know anything about uh, Jimmy LaValle? No, I really don't. I really don't know anything about him. Big Mo, the live witness was Irv Weiner, a very close friend of his. And they were on their way to the bagel. And it was crowded that day. I don't care what your news uh, says. I know what happened because I ran over there. But um, Irv Weiner was there. And they were supposed to go to the bagel. They are both Jewish. And the bagel was on Devon then. Right now, I believe it's on Kedzie. But um, they changed something along the way. There was a transmitter on uh, Irv Weiner. And so whoever was following which I assume was Schweiss, um, they knew where they were going. And they were set up and ready for him. Did the German have a weapon of choice? Yes. His weapon of choice was a, was a uh, 22, uh, 22 caliber with a six inch barrel and a silencer. And uh, he liked to empty it. And the back of somebody's head. Big Mo. So why did Frank hit him? Well, for the main reason, Joey told him. <laughs> Joey told him, go do it. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie M. Julie M just sent me a super sticker for $5. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, darling. Fudge Knuckles, Johnny Fudge Knuckles. Uh, well, if that's what he said, that's what he said. Thank you again, Julie. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Show me love. Thank you, darling. God bless you. You take care of those panic attacks now. <laughs> 69 viewers. Uh, Mr. Apollo, were any of these guys God-fearing? Do you think there was any remorse? They never showed it. They never showed any remorse at all. None of them that I knew or knew of. Why didn't Big Mo, why didn't they hit Irv? Why didn't they kill Irv Weiner? Well, there was no need to. Irv wasn't going to roll. Uh, the reason for 
the real reason behind this, Mo, was um, Joey Lombardo was arrested with um, Alan Dorfman. Alan Dorfman had done time in prison before, and he was kind of a, a businessman. He wasn't muscle. He wasn't like Joey, and he wasn't like anybody else. He was uh, uh, like Jimmy Hoffa's gopher. He just ran the pension board. So when it came time, uh, when they were both convicted and they had to turn into jail, there was talk that uh, I heard Joey say, he's talking about uh, he can't do the time. And uh, I told him, don't worry about it. And I think from that point on, I knew he was going, he was going down. They were going to kill him. I didn't know how. Mass, Mass Carphone, uh, he bait, was used to bait Dorfman only that one time. <laughs> and that was enough. You only need one time. Why was Irv left to tell anything? Because he was an intricate part of the bonding business and an intricate part of making money. And he was loyal and faithful. He went all the way back to Milwaukee, Phil. I mean, he was, uh, him and Phil were very close. Him and Tony Spalaccio were very close. And you got to remember that was 1975. And Tony was going strong. And so was uh, Irv. Irv was doing real good. A big earner. A very big earner. He, Irv was the first one to have... Uh, uh, what do they call them? Um, uh, welfare clinics in the city of Chicago in the 60s, the late 60s and early 70s. He had welfare clinics and he would build a state. So Irv was kind of a, a big earner. Johnny Fudge Knuckles. Red, I'm a good in <laughs> indication of how secret Chicago and the Chicago um, connected guys themselves. A lot of them have bad information. Yeah, they do. They do. I just made a comment on one of uh, uh, Street Stories picture. Uh, street Stories uh, put a picture up, a short, and. Uh, Somebody made a comment on that, on that thing and said, oh, it's over by Jimmy Cozo's place. And I said, no, that was in Joey Lombardo's alley. Joey was working on a car. So some people really don't have that information. Scott H., uh, why did Frank, uh, did Frank get rid of the gun immediately afterwards? Yes, it was found in a garbage can less than two blocks away. It was recovered. Mm. 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 Tim. But why Dorfman? He didn't squeal during the Hoffa stuff. I don't think he would have rolled. I don't think so either. It's not my opinion. But they made the calls. What any of my business? Thank you, Tim. Tim sent me a super sticker for $5. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, guy. I appreciate the love. God bless you. Leanne rolling along. Yeah. Who would you say was the most intimidating individual you've ever met? Uh, most intimidating would have been Sam D. Stefano, Sammy D. He was very intimidating. <laughs> It's hard to deal with somebody that's crazy. It really is. They're, you don't know what they're going to do. There's no guess. 
So you never know what they're going to do. But that's your answer, Leanne. Big Mo, you're right. He actually said he could, could not do time. Yes, he did. He said, I can't do it again. And, you know, that's something you don't say. Of course, they can kill you in prison, too. Jack Dapper, every time I drive by the Admiral Theater, I think of Schweiss. You know, he comes up in my mind, I think about the Admiral Theater a lot, too. Because he told me he built it uh, for um, um, Milwaukee Phil. And uh, they took it over back in the early days. And it just always stayed in the mob. Oh, it just got passed down. Thank you, Joseph. What day did you order my book, buddy? Mancar phone. What is the building that used to be called the spot? Is it vacant? No, it's not vacant. Jimmy Cozo's whole family still owns the building. His children and grandchildren, uh, they have condos there. It looks very much different, but the swimming pool is still there. The bar is still there. The original buildings are still there, but they remodeled uh, where the laundromat used to be. And that would be... Uh, on the, it starts at, at uh, there used to be a, a social club in the corner of that building, which is on uh, Rice and Racine. And it goes all the way uh, from Racine to Ogden in the one direction and from Racine to Ogden in the other direction, kind of a triangle. And uh, it's, not vac it's not vacant at all. It's very much in use, and it's prime property. Tony, yours, $5. Thanks for sharing Chicago history. You're reading my book. Well, t thank you, Tony. Thank you for, thank you for the uh, $5. I appreciate it. But I also, Tony, when you're done, go to, if you're an Amazon customer, go to Amazon and write a view, review. And uh, I'd appreciate that, buddy. Thank you so much. Big Mo, yes, that sealed his fate. Thank you, Lee. Kissy Cat he was considered a millionaire in the mob circle. Tony Accardo. <laughs> Tony Accardo. He was considered a millionaire. Other boss. Red, who was your main target in the 70s? Well, it wasn't Jimmy Iandino. I didn't even know him. And I don't think I had a main target in the 70s. I just didn't have one. I didn't have a main target until I heard about Tony's death. And then it was time to take down Schweiss. Liam, hey, Red, where can I buy your, your book? Well, Liam, if you're in the United States... Uh, I'll send you an autograph copy. Uh, there's a link for it. Uh, and it's the blow on this uh, a video in the description down the bottom. But it's at red, w r e d w e m e t t e dot com. I'll put it right in here for you, buddy. And uh, that'll help maybe. Thank you. 
Yes, Michael Graham, it sure is. Thank you, Liam. I'll make it out to you, buddy. I hope you're in the United States. I can't ship overseas. It's hard to read, but can you see chunks of it are about remodeling the meat block. I don't know. I, I don't know what you're saying. Liam, you're in Florida. That's easy. I'm up in Panama City, buddy. At any rate, we started out talking about Jimmy I and Dino, and we jumped to subjects that I know more about. Honestly, I really do. I was there. I was involved deeply. Odd thing is, a lot of these people that were referred to as uh, by thieves and other people that reported to them and gave them money or their end of the take, they would say when they looked in their eyes, they saw death. And I never looked in anybody's eyes and saw death ever. Yes. And I was referring to that one. Johnny Fudge Knuckles. Um, I was referring to that wiretap. He said, I believe his quote is, believe me, I'll break every bone in your body if you're not there with that money. Tim Peroni, was Jimmy Katura involved in the chop shops in the South Side, or was that his main source of income? I believe it was his main source of income. He had other things. He had prostitution. He had a lot of other things going on. Um, he even sent me out to Las Vegas one time, and I brought him home a bag. And allegedly, it had money in it, but I never opened it. I did a bedtime story about that. But Jimmy was a nice guy. Jimmy was the first May guy I ever met. I never met. He was an old timer. He spoke with a, bro a broken accent. Uh, he had English uh, or an Italian broken accent. Dorfman would have rolled on Hoffa. Wouldn't have rolled on Hoffa. He was only looking at a couple of years. And that 1982 conviction was facing the rest of his life and made a big difference. It might have been. It might have been. Geoff. Look in your eyes, Red. I see Italian beef and sausage sandwiches. Thank you, Michael. That's what I see when I look at them in the mirror. <laughs> Red, do you still think the tunnels in your uh, 1343 apartment? In the building, yeah, they're in the basement, and they are accessible. That's the way it went. Johnny Fug Knuckles. Uh, the Dwelly was incredible. Splash was a kind and polite to everybody. Would cut your throat. 
he wouldn't cut my throat. Or maybe he would have. If there would have been business involved, maybe it would have been something else. Johnny Fudge Knuckles. But uh, uh, the du duality was, uh, I don't know, certain people turn on you real fast. Lombardo wouldn't. And I don't think Tony would have either. He would have talked to you first. You'd have to uh, really do something bad. Kissy Cat. Did the wives know what was going on? Some of them did. Tanine did. Jimmy Cozo's uh, wife. She used to come back with, go out and come back with uh, shopping bags full of money. So she definitely knew she was picking it up from the off track betting parlors. Tim Hunt. Red, do you remember Chicago Meat House? Satellite store was in the suburbs, Belmont and Downers Grove. No, I only meat I ever re, I ever remember was uh, the meat block, which was uh, Frank Schweiss. Tim Stifles, I need to go. And <laughs> I need to eat. I need to eat one of those if I ever can get to Chicago. Well, I'll tell you what, Tim. I don't know where you're at, but if you can, try that Italian beef. You'll like it. Leanne rolling along. What kind of food do you miss? Kind of Chicago. I think you meant what kind mm. what kind of Chicago food do you miss the most not being in Chicago anymore? Italian food. Leanne, Italian food. It was good. There were a lot of tunnels, Tim, to roll into. I know there was one in the green mill that was well used. It got boarded up or bricked up or something like that. Streets and sanitation uh, bricked them up. There's a lot of tunnels. There's miles of tunnels down there. Temperoni, so how did your skin work at off-track bedding houses? Don't really understand the question. Off-track bedding parlors were people walk into them, and allegedly they were supposed to uh, take the money and run it to the racetracks but it was really a way of having a bookie right there because they didn't do that. Mass car phone. I don't know. I don't know who has Johnny's beef in uh, Elmwood park. I really don't. Tim. Um, Frank said, Nancy, Went off uh, catching Tony with a girl. Yeah, that's that's what I heard. <laughs> Michael Graham, Tokyo Joe Ito was actually shot in the head and survived. Yes, he was. Johnny Catuso was really stupid. Really stupid. He cut those rounds in half, man. You don't cut a 22 and a half. They're not that powerful to begin with. Uh, skim? There was no skim. You had a partner. I was approached to, uh, Tim, now I know what you're talking about. Um, I was approached to open up uh, one of the grandstand um, chain for Jimmy Cozo on Juan Avenue. And when I did... Uh, or when he approached me, I went and looked at the place and he laid out all the facts for me. We were partners, 50-50. It wasn't a skim. If you operated the business, they set you up in it. If you operated the business, they give you half of it. Just don't cheat them. 
Never steal from, never steal from the mob. Anyway, folks, I want to thank you all for stopping by. Thank you for all the love. Please hit the, the like button. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. And God bless everybody. I hope you have a wonderful week. And I'm looking forward to seeing you Wednesday with Adam. And just be well. Everybody be well, be safe. And like I said, God bless you. The combination of the videotapes and we met's testimony resulted in the conviction of two men on extortion charges. One of them was Frank Schweiz, known in syndicate circles as the German, a feared mob terrorist and a suspect in a number of gangland murders. He was described to me by other outfit individuals as uh, the most feared hitman. And uh, as he said to me, my reputation precedes me, son.